Hi students and welcome back to The Sound of Science. Today we're going to be talking about evolution and how organisms change over time. Today we're really going to focus more on the history of evolution. Make sure as you're taking your notes on this you are paying close attention to the people. Make sure you're paying close attention to any vocabulary words I give you and make sure that you're paying close attention to how the process itself is working. Okay, first of all, let's talk about this guy right here. His name is Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. And Jean-Baptiste Lamarck is a scientist who's very interested in how organisms change over time. And he comes up with this hypothesis. He believes that organisms change over time through this process of use or disuse. And this is what he kind of bases it on. When you see an individual who is constantly using their arms to lift heavy things, their arms start to grow larger and they become stronger. And he feels like that's how organisms get the characteristics that they have, the traits that they have. He gives the example of giraffes. Giraffes, he believes, were one time had very short necks. And over time, giraffes wanting to reach the leaves that were higher up in the trees stretched and stretched and stretched and stretched until eventually their necks became just a little bit longer. And this is the part where Baptiste sort of makes his first error in judgment. He believes that these changes that you can make to your body can then be passed on to your offspring. They can be passed on to your babies. And he believes that's how we end up with giraffes that have these long necks now because they stretched and stretched till their necks got a tiny bit longer. And then all their babies were born with necks that were just a tiny bit longer. And then those giraffes stretched and stretched and stretched. And then their babies were born with necks that were a little bit longer until eventually you have giraffes that have the necks they have now. Obviously, this is, is really not the way that biology works. If somebody works out and they become a bodybuilder and they're big and full of muscles, their children are not going to be born that way. That's not how this works. We can't pass on these changes to our children unless they are genetic. But we're going to cut Lamarck some slack because he is trying to come up with a theory. Um, and even though his theory is wrong, science does what science does. The nature of science is to test and test and test and retest. And that's what Lamarck does. And he ends up eventually kind of realizing that this is not the way that it can work. And he starts looking at this next guy. So this guy right here, his name is Charles Darwin. Darwin is really a very interesting character. He is one of my favorite failures of all time. So let me tell you a little bit about Darwin. Darwin is this kid whose dad's a physician and his dad wants him to be a doctor, like really, really wants him to be a doctor. Charles Darwin doesn't really want to be a doctor. Well, maybe. He, what he really enjoys is hanging out in the woods and he likes taking nature walks and he likes collecting things and he likes examining things in nature. And, and that's really what he enjoys most. And so um, I imagine that his father probably looked at him like, oh, he's like a hippie. <laughs> and so he said, well, Charles, you're going to medical school. And so he sends Charles to medical school and he gets there and Darwin has to take part in classes, as you do. And at this time period in the early 1800s, they are, the way you learn to be a doctor is you actually observe medical procedures. So it's actually called the operating theater because people are watching. Charles goes in, one of his very first operations that he has to observe is this surgical procedure that's being done on a child. Um, early 1800s, there's no anesthesia. This, this kid is completely awake the entire time. And Darwin is all done. He is like, absolutely not. Peace out, y'all. I ain't doing this. He goes home and he tells his dad, I can't be a doctor. I just can't. He, he's just a little squeamish. He's like, I, I can't do this. So his dad's like, fine. I know a man who is on the HMS Beagle. Now, HMS stands for Her Majesty's Ship or His Majesty's Ship. Um, the Beagle was the name of the ship. And the Beagle's job was an, to be an exploration vessel. And the captain really was looking for a ship's naturalist. Now, this is right up Darwin's alley. This is exactly what he wants to do. And the captain really wanted somebody who was kind of well-led and knew what he was talking about so we could have sort of a dinner companion. Um, 
which, which worked out well. And so Darwin gets hired on to be the ship's naturalist on the HMS Beagle. Starting in 1831, they set sail. He is horribly seasick. In fact, he is horribly seasick the entire voyage. He hates every second of it. And in fact, there is this, um, this journal that he writes in. And at one point, it's like, you know, I hate everyone. Everyone is stupid. I feel very poorly today. And, and I, I feel that in my soul that, that Darwin really, it was a struggle for him. But some of the best times of his voyage were when he was exploring Argentina, exploring the Galapagos. Um, he is looking at fossils and then he is looking at living creatures. And some of the things that he sees makes him start to think. For instance, he sees fossils of these giant sloths. And these sloths are like, like 12 feet tall. They're huge. And then he sees the skeletons left behind and, and the actual living sloths that exist now. And he sees how they're similar, just a different size. He looks at the small tortoises on the mainland of Argentina, and then he compares them to these giant tortoises that he sees on the Galap Galapagos Islands. Um, these tortoises are so big that Darwin actually talks about how you can ride the backs of these tortoises. He then looks at these finches on these islands. And he realizes that they all have such similar features. And then he looks at the marine and the mainland iguanas. And he wasn't too impressed with marine iguanas. The iguanas on the mainland were this, you know, they're pretty green and they hang out in the trees and they do their thing. The marine iguanas on the Galapagos Islands are, um, as he says, they're, they're ugly, they're sluggish, um, and you have to understand that these iguanas really have a face that only a mother can love. They sneeze out salt snot all the time to try to regulate their, their bodies. They're, they're not super attractive animals. And Darwin really, really dislikes them. Um, but they seem to be related to these mainland iguanas, just like the finches seem to be related to one another, just like the tortoises seem to be related to one another, just like the sloths seem to be related to one another. And all this sort of swirls around in Darwin's head. So Darwin finishes up his voyage and he goes home. And the very first thing that he does is he marries his wife, who happens to be um, a first cousin. Um, she is part of the Wedgwood family, which of course he's related to, but the Wedgwood family is, these are the people that are making China, um, like the expensive dishes. And so she has lots of money. So Darwin doesn't really have to have a job at this point because his wife comes with her inheritance. And so Darwin has time to sit around and read, and he has time to sit around and study things. And Darwin has time to do things like breed fancy pigeons. That's actually um, one of his hobbies is breeding fancy pigeons and looking at mussels, not mussels like mussels, but like mussels like the little bivalves, the little clams. One of the things that he reads is by a mathematician whose name is Malthus. And Malthus talks about differential reproductive success. He says that having um, lots of offspring, lots of children, not all are gonna survive till adulthood. So Malthus applies this to humans and he actually applies it to social welfare and social justice. And Darwin reads this paper by Malthus and thinks, well, couldn't that be the same for organisms? Couldn't. Organisms that have the better characteristics, the better traits, wouldn't they have a better chance of surviving till adulthood, which means they're the ones that are reproducing? This is a really, really important point in the story of evolution. Meanwhile, a couple decades have passed since Darwin has taken his trip on the HMS Beagle. And he has all of this data that he's collected. And he collected a lot of organisms and a lot of information. And one day, this student, um, whose last name is Wallace, comes and knocks on the door, literally just shows up at Darwin's house and 
says, oh, you know, Mr. Darwin, I want to talk to you about some of the things that you've written and some of the things that you've seen. I have this theory. And this theory is that organisms that are better suited to life live long enough to have babies and reproduce, meaning that their babies are even better suited. And Darwin's like, oh, oh, that's that's very interesting, um, Alfred. Now, you should go back and read that some more. And immediately Darwin publishes the theory. Now, Darwin didn't steal the theory from Wallace. Um, it was more of a case of Darwin sort of came up with the theory already, but hadn't published it yet. And this just was what encouraged him to go ahead and publish his theory before Wallace could. And, and truthfully, he'd sat on it for, you know, 20 something years. It, it was time for him to publish. So Darwin publishes his theory and he calls it on the origin of species, evolution by natural selection. The theory itself is not that evolution exists. The theory is how evolution occurs. Now, before you feel too bad for Wallace, um, he and Darwin end up kind of frenemies that turn into friends. Um, Wallace and Darwin actually become colleagues and they end up working um, really as friends as they become older. And, and not that they ever really worked on anything together, but they would bounce ideas off of each other. According to Darwin, then organisms are going to change over time, sometimes in response to environmental change, but they do it slowly. And they do it because those that are better suited to their environment live longer, have more offspring, and therefore pass more of those traits, more of their, their characteristics on to the next generation. Now, this is a time when we're just starting to understand genes and genetics and how those things work. And so Darwin's kind of flying blind here, but really what he's getting at is those organisms that are better adapted, those that fit their environment, are going to pass their genes on to the next generation, whereas those that are poorly suited to the environment probably aren't going to make it to adulthood. They're never going to reproduce, and those genes are going to die out with them. Now, this example that I've given you here is the evolution of the horse, and so you can see that down this little bottom one, this is where horses start, and this is now the modern horse, and obviously these are sort of cartoony, but you can see the changes in horses over time. We actually go from something that has several toes something that has one main toe. Um, we have something that has sort of this tail that is mostly almost like a lion's tail. Um, and how over time it becomes more of a, a mane and tail. Um, just the difference in the head shape, difference in the body size, difference in the legs, all of these things are in response to the environment these organisms are living in. And the other part of Darwin's theory is that this is happening really because they happen to have these characteristics. Today, we know that the characteristics are due to their genes, due to their genetic traits. And those genes can be determined either, you know, there could be a mutation to cause a difference, but we also know that there has to be that natural variation. When we talk about natural versus artificial selection, really what we're talking about is a natural selection, these are organisms that are well adapted to their environment. So for instance, um, if you see in the picture on the right, you'll see the hawk come kind of flying over and the hawk is picking off the white mice. And that's why by the time we get to the third generation there, we have very few white mice remaining. Most of the mice are the dark gray. They fit in with their surroundings. That's because the hawk can't see them as well. It's not as easy to pick out the gray mice. So the hawks are more likely to go for the mice they can see better. The mice that are gray are well adapted to their environment. They're the ones that live the longest. They're going to reproduce. They're the ones that are gonna pass those genes on to the next generation. And we know that typically organisms are going to look like their parents. Artificial selection is different. Artificial selection is when humans are gonna choose which traits we want to see. And that is how we end up with the crazy types of pigeons that we see here in this picture on the left. Um, 
truthfully, fantail pigeons, we, we don't, we're not going to get these in the wild. There is no circumstance where that is going to be beneficial to an organism trying to survive. Um, the same thing with some of these brighter colored pigeons, um, the frillback pigeons. These pigeons, they're not well adapted to the environment, but we've bred them in such a way to encourage those characteristics. Think back to genetics when we talked about selective breeding. All of this relates. But even though with, we've done it intentionally, it's still a type of evolution if it causes the population to change. All right, one more example here. So natural selection of the rock pocket mouse. Rock pocket mouse starts off um, as this really kind of light colored, sandy colored little mouse, lives in the desert, hangs out, everything's good. It tends to have white bottoms and sort of this sandy light colored back. It is picked off by most things in the desert, but owls and hawks are gonna be the number one predator. So death comes from above for the rock pocket mouse. So over time, there's actually a volcanic eruption in the desert and this causes lava fields to develop. The lava is gonna be dark stone. Well, those light colored mice really show up very well on the dark rocks and they start getting picked off. Now, in the beginning, when it was just sand, the light colored mice were selected for. That meant they were well adapted to their environment. They were more likely to survive longer and have more babies. Therefore, more of the mice were going to be light colored. But after the lava fields are there, those mice stick out. So what we find is that now it's shifted and the dark colored mice are better adapted and are more likely to live longer and have more babies, thus creating more dark colored mice in the population. The rock pocket mouse population actually ends up sort of splitting in two. And we find that light colored mice tend to hang out in the sand, dark colored mice tend to hang out on the lava rocks. So where there's lots of lava rocks, the population of mice tends to be very dark in color. Where there's mostly sand, the population of mice tends to be very light in color. And all of this happens over the course of 10,000 years. This is not happening overnight. This takes time to develop. So I just sort of want to point out this particular example, the rock pocket mouse is sort of a classic evolutionary example. So now we've talked about a couple of examples of natural selection. Let's talk about what we have to have for natural selection. There needs to be variation in the population. If the whole population is exactly the same, there's nothing for natural selection to act on. There needs to be overproduction. That means that some organisms are not gonna survive. You have to have more than are likely to survive for evolution to occur. Environmental pressure. There has to be something in the environment that is encouraging the organism to become better adapted. For instance, it could be a predator, it could be type of food, food available, it could be the amount of space that's available, it could be a disease that's occurring in the environment. Any of those things could be environmental pressures. And regardless, it's going to encourage the organisms to be better adapted to that pressure. Survival of the fit or survival of the fittest, although that's sort of a misnomer, means that those that are best suited or adapted to their environment are more likely to survive. And thereby, they're more likely to have babies and pass those genes on to the next generation. Adaptation, any characteristic that helps an organism survive in its environment. Make sure that you understand all of these vocab terms and make sure you write down survival of the fittest, what it means and how that's related to Darwin's theory. That's all we have time for today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about Darwin in class. We'll talk a little bit more about these, um, this, this particular type of and change that we see in organisms over time. Uh, but until next time, this has been Sound of Science. See you then.